I would like to be able to say a few words about, for those who are interested, a man I worked for, the chief of station for the National Security Agency in the Central Third of South Vietnam, Mr. Antuna. He was an incredible soldier. Early in the morning of the first day of the invasion of Normandy, he took a bullet in the Adam's apple, a rifle round, from the front, then went out the back, the side of his neck. Only with reconstructive surgery and putting in something of a voice box of an artificial manufactured nature, he could speak. He could only speak in this tone. My name is Mr. Antona. That was it. He had an incredible bullet wound, entry wound, right at the Adam's apple. Came out the side of of his rear of his neck. But he was a soldier. One time, he and I were pinned down near the Mang Ho camp of a South Vietnamese Korean Tiger Division near Quinh Yon. We were there to deal with the, the general in charge, Korean Army's division about their security communications arrangements. And we ran into an ambush. And we were we were pulled into the into the elephant grass beside the road. And as we were pinned down in the ambush, Mr. Antuna raised his head and turned around towards me and said, Well, Dave, are we winning the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people today? And all I could do was laugh. Well under fire from close arms, small type, and supporting mortars. But he had been through battles in World War II, in Vietnam, before he came, excuse me, Korea, before he came to Vietnam. And in Vietnam, he was totally courageous. He was an extraordinary soldier, an extraordinary man. And he let me mock him, and I was the only person that could mock him. I used to imitate his voice and his mannerisms, and he let me do that. He was totally self-confident himself. Another person I would like to make a few comments about is a man who I met through a very odd circumstance because of my ability to look at anyone's documents for any purpose at any time and my authority to just simply tell people that I could do what I wanted to do and it was their job to accommodate me. I was able to monitor goods into the port of Quinyan, which was a pre-manufactured in in the Philippines pier that had been towed and installed in the port of Quinyan. And this maritime port had a pier that appeared to me to be a mile long pier built in sections, brought there, installed. And it was the third most active port in South Vietnam. 
brought in every kind of cargo. And I made arrangements with the shipmasters for cargo transfer to get special things for my communication centers across Vietnam, which averaged about 47, as I've said earlier. And there came a time when I and Colonel Stringfellow, who was the commander of, of uh, the battalion that we were attached to, and the captain of Company B, 41st Signal Battalion, and a Sergeant Major, Maroney, had agreed that I could find cement it was brought in by the Air Force in special planes landing on basically raw ground and we agreed to go steal some cement from the Air Force which was there for runway construction and use it to put in more slabs on this swamp that we lived in for our barracks and bunkers. And so those arrangements were made, not by me directly, but by others in this group after I had spotted the cement at what became Fukat Air Base, which for tactical fighter bombers. And early in the morning, Two men assigned a two and a half ton truck and appropriate weapons and so forth were out there loading up sacks of cement to build more slab on grades at Company B, 41st Signal Battalion in Quinyan, right by the ocean, which all of the ground underneath us was totally was totally seabed in wading. I mean, it was the water would go up and down below us with the tides. Well. They were arrested by air police. And when I got back to Company B, 41st Signal Battalion, the next day from being out visiting one of my communication centers, I found out about these two men from Company B having been arrested for theft of cement. When they were ordered by Colonel Kobaki, I mean, Captain Kobaki, Colonel Stringfellow, I, I sh shouldn't use the captain's name. Strike that if you can. He was a great graduate of West Point. He might be embarrassed all these years later. But he was a great soldier too. But one of the soldiers who was captured refused to implicate anyone else, including a sergeant major who had sent him or anybody. He was willing to take take the arrest and whatever. And I found out about this when I got back to base at Company B in Quinyan that next day. And I went into the bunker of the command commander and discussed with him that I could simply pick up refrigeration equipment from one of the incoming freighters and deliver it to the Phuket Air Base site because they could have refrigerated food. We only had canned food for the Army because we didn't have aircraft flying to other countries that could bring back fresh fruit, fresh vegetables and other fresh food. So we ate out of cans for my three tours. Sea rations most of them left over from the Korean War, which was fun. But the point is, we didn't have fresh water either, which still pisses me off about our troops in Afghanistan, Iraq, and other places. They get water that's clean. We had water that 
I wouldn't want to tell you about. And so I went to the bunker of the Colonel, Stringfellow, told him that I could steal from a freighter refrigeration equipment, divert it to the Air Force base that was being constructed for, for fighter bombers, and could thus, he could make a deal with the Air Force general to get our two men out of custody and sent back to us. Now these things happen, these requisitions happen in every war and always have. They're a standard part of war. But the Colonel Stringfellow was afraid. He was afraid for what might happen in his career because he was dealing with a very volatile Air Force general who he thought would, would have him arrested. I felt the Colonel was a coward and I told him that he had to follow my order to call the Air Force general in charge of the Phuket Air Base under construction, have our soldiers released and take responsibility for them having taken the sacks of cement. He refused out of fear. So I gave him something else to fear. I had a reputation that you can't explain in the civilian world. Because I built several thousand bombs to protect communication centers, cryptographic equipment and codes all across the center of South Vietnam. And people have a visceral fear of bombs. I don't. Bombs to me are just fun toys. I love building them. I love testing them to see if, if, if they would be sufficient for the purposes. I enjoyed after we built fortified bunkers to put our communication centers in. I enjoyed blowing up bombs equivalent to and, a, and double the, the size of the Vietnamese bombs for the Viet Cong or the North Vietnamese. Their heaviest weapons, heaviest explosives. And I built weapons, double the firepower, and tested them on our own stations after we built them. Used that as a test at the end of construction. And other people have a tremendous visceral fear of explosives. And I enjoyed it because of my childhood. And I knew that, and I gave Stringfellow in a meeting in his office, it was quite heated and overheard by all of his staff, that he had one hour to change his mind, accept responsibility for the theft of the sacks of cement, personally, from the base under construction at Phuket. And if he failed to do that, within an hour, I would come back and kill it myself. And I had the kind of reputation that would give anyone pause who dealt with me. And I told him I was leaving then into the Vietnamese city of Quinh Yon, which bordered our gate, and I would be there in hiding for an hour. If I did not get word that he had accepted my deal, I was going to come back and nothing could stop me from killing him. And that, of course, was true. I was very gifted in the deadly arts of war. <laughs>